Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Munan Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. You know, subhanAllah, Dr. Sherman Jackson, he has a, a phrase he's been saying a lot lately. And that's, he, he keeps talking about the difficulty and the challenges of speaking truth to pain. And I don't know about you, but sitting here listening has been painful. It's, it's been an experience where you're just like, Oh, oh, please say something to make me laugh, to, you know, remove this, this, this burden I feel on my chest. So before I delve into it, I want to go back to the title of this session is called Easier Said Than Done, Unity in Diversity. I want to ask the audience actually about two to three questions and, and you help me out. So the first thing I want to ask you is, is there any one group of people in general that you would say is left out of the unity of, of, of our community? Who, who, who's left out? The black people? What about the Asians, they left out? They good. They good? She's like, they good. Who else, anybody else? Native Americans. Native Americans, the Hispanics, okay. Who would you say is the most left out? Black folk, you would say black folk. Okay, all right. Alhamdulillah, okay. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Muhammad. When you think of black, when I just use the word black in this context, in this setting, just call out some words that come to your mind. When you think, mashallah, when you say beautiful, call out some words that come to your mind, like black in America, what comes to your mind? Say, say it loud. What, traveled? Troubled. Troubled. Uh-huh. What else? Powerful. What else? Oppressed. Oppressed. Angry. Murder. Yes, indeed. Say again. Poverty. Yes. Violence. Police brutality. Okay. So, yeah. All right. We're on the same page. So I've been challenged with the topic, the general topic was unity, uh, easier said than done, unity and diversity. And specifically for me, I'm supposed to cover called being black and being Muslim. And many of you are familiar with this, this phrase came together about two years ago um, in some of the aftermath of some of the things that you've called out. So before I even begin though, before we even jump into it, I want us to have a collective intention, inshallah. Because if we have a collective intention, then even by that, we may have some unity. We may have something that we can walk out together, we can walk out of this session with. The beloved messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said that every action is by its intention and you will be dealt with according to what you intended. So it's extremely, we want Allah to deal with us in mercy, right? And I don't want this to be another session because it is an extremely important session. I don't want this to be a mass, a mass session that you walk out of and you're wondering, you're saying, I, I, you know, say, wow, that was interesting. What was it about? Um, it was interesting. What did he talk? Yeah, he was talking, you know what I mean? Yeah, it was interesting, right? <laughs> Next week you'll be like, how was mass? It was interesting. <laughs> What was what sessions you went to? Uh, some about uh, disagreement and some about culture, right? I want us to have. I want us to walk away with something that's strong. So, be idnila. I'm gonna call out a few intentions and please grab them and place them in your heart. We're here by the intention to expose ourselves to the mercy of Allah. We're here by the intention to to expose ourselves to the healing of Allah. That Allah subhanahu wa taala will strengthen the ummah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. That He will allow us to walk away from our sicknesses and our illnesses internally, and that He will uh, that He will grant us an expansion and a wisdom 
wisdom, that he will grant us an enlightenment, that he will remove and eradicate any darkness that, that, that leads to sin in our hearts, that we may be removed from kibbutz or any quality that would take us away from the garden of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're here by the intention that we can save ourselves and our children from the hellfire. We're here by the intention that we can be a means of upliftment and empowerment to each other. We're here by the means that we, we're here by the intention that we can be a means to the solution. Say Allahumma Amin. So being black and Muslim, I want to quote this so interesting that this, when I thought about this topic, it was actually a very white uh, writer that came to my mind, Charles Dickens. And you're probably very familiar with it. He said, being black and being Muslim to me right now is, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. <laughs> it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. <laughs> it was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. Because when I, if I talk about being black, we automatically think of the opposite, right? And that's a, that's a conditioning. That if I were, and I am going to get to it, let me make sure I'm on right time, right? That when we think of being black in America, it's, it's almost, it's impossible to talk about that without white supremacy, right? And not just, not just white supremacy in general, but white male supremacy and white Christian male supremacy. It's impossible to talk about that in this context without that. But the problem with that is we always start there making ourselves or making blackness a footnote in his story. But if I, as a, I, so I'm going to start at the end with being Muslim. Because if we were to look at the Quran, the majority of the Quran takes place in Africa. The majority of the stories in the Quran are talking about the lives and, and the lives of black folk and revelation that came to them and how that began to spread through the world. Majority of these stories are taking place inside those contexts. But for whatever reason, if I were to say to you, list for me some black folk in the Quran, what would you say? Right? You say, little girl, say, Luke, ma, I get it. Right? We would begin to, like, oh, let me think. Uh, let me think about it for a minute. Even though majority of it takes place inside of Africa. So I want us to begin, because especially as Muslims, our, our default answer of black and Muslim is Bilal ibn Raba, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. That's like our default answer, as if he was the only black person ever in Islamic history. And so the, and the problem with that, the narrative with that, is that we begin to equate that, amen, we're always equating blackness and slavery. Right? We're not equating blackness with the Quran. We're not equating blackness with righteousness. We're not equating blackness with, 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 a, with an intrinsic nature in Islam. But subhanAllah, we're not equating blackness with the origin of its word, which is the origin of Aswad, is, is mastery. Right? So how do you, with blackness and mastery, how does that relate? We got to go back to what our brother Check Mikael mentioned before with when that knowledge comes in. So let's let's give a review of it. So my daughter who's a Taekwondo, you know, she's six, she's doing her, you know, she's got her blue belt. Right? So when she masters that, what will she get? What color belt will she get? She will get a black belt. And when you have mastered the law, what robe will you wear? You're gonna wear a black robe. Right? So that, and how is that? That means that you have mastered a, a level of language. And so through this, we're going to talk about, we're going to just kind of get through, well, what have black folk mastered in order to live up? Or what is it that they need to master? Or what lessons must they extract from the Quran and the examples throughout history in order so that they would be considered masters and masters of what? So I'm going to, I'm going to skip, actually. I'm going to go to, um... I'm going to talk about Hajar for a moment, right? And it's, it's important because when we think about Egypt, many times we think about like Cairo today. And the interesting thing about Cairo today is it looks nothing like Egypt looked then. 
right? Especially, and part of that is because if you recognize what Pharaoh did for that period of time is that very similar to what's happening today is he removed generations of black men and so then those women were left to intermarry with other people. So what happens is that when you remove generations of black men, when you skim them off the top, you begin to have people that look a little lighter in color until you get what we have in Egypt today. But that's a, you know, and that, that's talking about hundreds of years of that, that transition. And then they kind of, you know, then we say, you know, Nubians, but how we, how we separate ourselves, subhanAllah. So I want to talk about Hajar because this is a woman without a shadow of a doubt that was a black woman. And when we, subhanAllah, the place that she holds in Islam is so great and magnificent in the fact that she, she's, she's given this great maqam because she stands on yaqeen in the face of some serious, uh, in, the sa in the face of some serious adversity, in the face of what would seemingly be a trial. Have I been, have I been left? Have I been abandoned, right? Am I going to stand alone in this situation? But subhanAllah, Allah literally begins to build the holiest Islamic city and the Islamic state around her. And you cannot finish Hajj, you cannot complete your fifth pillar of this deen unless you walk in the footsteps of Hajar, right? So, which is deep, because you're going to walk in the footsteps of Anbiya and you're going to walk in the footsteps of Hajar, right? Which just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just revealing a little bit about her maqam. And she has no idea that about more than 5,000 years later, yes, our beloved Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam would be born in that place and our deen would be established in that place. But subhanAllah, it would also be the place where Umm Ayman was born. It would also be the place where Baraka, a very black woman who Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam said is the mother after my mother would be born in that place. It would also not just be the place where Bilal ibn Rabah, when the, when the, the, uh, when the concept of someone being better than me was being pushed upon him, when, the, when a serious oppression was being pushed upon him, he had a spiritual mastery that occurred in that moment and he was able to push back and say, Ahad, right? And even in subhanAllah, bihamdi, it's, it's beyond that, this would be the one that Rasulullah alayhi salatu was salam would put his bare feet on top of the Kaaba and say, you will be the one who will give the call to Islam. You will call them to iqamati salah, to establish the connection with Allah. So then we're going to fast forward. Through from that, you get, you, we got the first hijrah. First hijrah is where? We love Medina, mashallah. But the first hijrah is where? To Abyssinia. You seen Abyssinia lately? I'm just checking. Do we think about that in our consciousness of being black and Muslim? Right, so then we can fast forward, and I'm, you know, for the sake of time, we're gonna fast forward into West Africa and the countless, not, I mean, like Muslim kingdoms and great, you know, and greatness that comes out of that, including the great knowledge. They have not, they have books inside of right now of Mali, between Mali and Mauritania and Senegal. We have not even began to translate the level of scholarship that has come out of that place, right? There was one particular scholar who was. Um, he was actually, he came, he heard about what was happening. Uh, he was, Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak Sayyidina Muna Muhammad. It'll come to me his origin. He was of out of origin. Long story short, he'd heard what was happening in Timbuktu. And so he said, I'm going to go and help these Africans out because Islam is new to them. So he said, I'm going to go help these Africans out and, and be a teacher in the univer in Sankor, in the university there in Timbuktu. And when he got there, he said, I'm not even qualified to be a student in this place. Let me go back and like, you know, get some more knowledge. And then he came back and became a student in that place. From there we get, you know that Mansa Musa, but you may not know his brother Abu Bakr, who actually led 120 fleets into America and detailed maps of the internal aspects of America, the Mississippi River, including uh, several mountain ranges of America about 300 years before Columbus. Why is this important? Because it is not fair because we already, because white supremacy
has ruled our understanding so much that we will begin to define blackness or the, on, based on the basis of, of slavery, on the basis of colonialism. But, and I don't even, and, and we have allowed their story to become our story. So even when we introduce into the Massagen Black History Month, we start from there. And I'm saying, no, if you want to talk about my history, you got to back that up. Matter of fact, you can start with the Quran. You could start there if you want to talk about my history. And this is important because this kind of stuff divides us. Because we're the people of la ilaha illallah and not one of us would disagree in terms of the, the value and the truth of the Quran. So if you start there, we can begin to, we can begin to have a, a true level of respect because saying that you're colorblind or I don't see color isn't true respect, it's erasure. It's saying I'm not going to take the time to get to know you or your value or what contribution your people specifically have brought to the world or to this country. I'm going to pretend like I don't see that. Now you know you lie and you know when you see me you, you ain't have to adjust your TV. You know I was black when I stood up here. So why do we tell each other these lies as if I'm, we're mostly lying to ourselves? Right? And so if we were to skip through that, then we'd say, well, you know, the origin of Islam in America that we know of, the most well-known, most popular, where we would consider the nation of Islam. I'm going to say, no, you have to back that up about 20 years. You're going to have to back that up to Sheikh Ahmed Dao Faisal and his wife Khadija Dao Faisal, who actually started an Islamic Sunni movement from New York and took that down, you know, down the East Coast into the Midwest. Actually, part of that came into Detroit before uh, Elijah Muhammad came into the Nation of Islam. And he came actually from the Ahmadiyya movement. So he actually didn't come through black folk. They came actually from a, a sheikh from Sudan. Including, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Munan Muhammad. When we get into the stories of Noble Drew Ali, even Marcus Garvey, what's significant about all of this is that usually when African Americans or black, Af black Americans convert to Islam, it's because they saw, they, they found in it an empowerment. They found in it something that spoke to them. Because there's a four, about a 40 to 60 year gap that we find when we are talking about slavery. There's about a 40 to 60 year gap where there's a, basically where they have been robbed of all the aspects of maqasid al-sharia. They, they have been definitely, when we talk about the preservation of life, if they called the adhan, the first punishment was their tongue would be cut out. If they were caught praying, their feet would be cut off or it started with their toes. And if they continued to do so, they would be lynched or killed. So I'm talking about preservation of their life. Then we're talking about the preservation of their lineage. They did everything within their power to make sure that their lineage was cut off. They were disconnected from their lineage and definitely they, when they stole them from, and I, I want us to understand, they didn't steal savages. They went into what would be considered West African kingdoms of establishment and civilization. And they said, wow, look at what they have built for themselves. I need them to, for them to build that for me for free in America. They stole them because they were more than qualified. Right? They stole them because they were worthy. So when they stole them, they, they removed them from their property, from their wealth, and, and literally the slaves who got off the boat, when you see them, pictures of them naked and in chains, those are not the, sla those are not the same people who got on the boat. That's not what they looked like before that. But when we instill these images in our mind, I'm telling you, it leaves an imprint into us today, especially of us who are not from that experience, that they were poor and that they were savages and in somehow that it was a miracle who civilized them. But if we were to look at, even in terms of the statistics of voting, like more, more recently, the voting situation that happened in Alabama, 
uh, between Roy Moore and his opponent, when they did the statistics, it was actually black women who tipped the scale. That, and that's just one, that's just the example that comes to my mind. When we look at it across the board, we find that African Americans have been a moral consciousness in this country, have been a, 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 a call to moral, to moral code. And I find that always very interesting because people, for the most part, you know, when they, when the description I hear of black people is like they're poor, or they were thieves, or they were drug dealers, or they were this or that, I said, I don't remember that. Not anywhere in my neighborhood. And no, I wasn't from the hood. That's another thing, right? Is that I remember I was explaining to my husband, I remember being six and the, the level of rigidity of not just, not just good character, you know, moral character, like we couldn't wear, you know, shorts and, you know, shirt and sh like spaghetti strap shirt, and that was out. You weren't going to do that, right? <laughs> that, that wasn't going to happen. Um, but even more so than that, I can remember being six and memorizing like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, the letter to the Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, and Ephesians, right? First and Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, Hebrews, James, First and Second Peter, First and Second and Third John, Jude, and Revelation, right? <laughs> right? You remember that? What do you? Some of you are like, what's that? It's the books of the Bible that I remember that I memorized when I was about six. Right? Because why? That was the conversation in my household. That this was, this, this was what was stored in my, in my brain as a child. That was, and it was very much connected, that being connected to God and being connected to a holy book and being connected to a people who prayed, that was a part of, that was part of being black. That's, that's how it was explained to me. And so being, converting to Islam for me was a natural progression, right? Amongst, and you will find many African Americans, not, I'm not a single story, many African Americans will tell you that same story. So I, I want, I just challenge all of us to, to begin to look at the colonialism in our lands before we arrive in this one and before that caused us to, to buy in to colorism and buy in to a narrative that's not 100% that's not true. And we might say, okay, well, what does that have to do with today? Let's go to Stefan Clark. Yeah, say his name. <laughs> is that when that rolled across many of our TV screens, before he was announced Muslim, most of us just kept it moving, right? And then even more so, even when he was Muslim, some of us were like politically correct, or like, yes, let me pull my heart to this consciousness, began to respond. But then there was also like this underlying, and people would come to me and say, there was this underlying, say, well, he was in the backyard. And they were looking for someone in the backyard. And so I just want to ask you, if, if you have children or a brother, I, I want to say, because I'm sure in the next couple months they're going to say he was guilty, right? That they found the, the thing that he was using to break into the cars. I want you to do two things. I want you to scan your car for a minute, see what's in your car. Would you be willing to die for it? How about be shot 20 times for it? How about hold your brother in your arms and let his blood bleed on you from 20 bullet bullets? Let's say he was guilty. Where in our dean does theft equate to 20 bullets? So our buy-in to this racism and this colorism has created a schism in our minds. So when we talk about unity and diversity in the community, we, we need to visit where is the unity inside between my, between my, my ideals and my culture, my colorism and my dean. We, need to, we have to rectify that. And the sad thing about it is, it's scary. 
because Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam, so you won't enter Jannah with one ounce of kibr in your heart. One ounce of belief that you're better than somebody else. Not one ounce. Which is scary, because this, we know that this was the disease and the action of, of shaitan. And where does it come from? So if we were to look at Iblis, right? Iblis comes from, the, the root of Iblis is balasat, to be hopeless, to lose hope. What did he lose hope in? Right? He's like, I've been worshiping you, Allah. I, I've, been, I've been Muslim for how many generations? I speak Arabic. I speak Urdu. I went to, the, you know, my people, we come from Muslim lands. We, you know, I've been wearing hijab. I, whatever, I, 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 like Shaitan, right? He had, a, he had a very high station. It's like, I've been doing all this. You just, you brought him on the scene. You created him from black mud. You want me to bow down to him? They're a hopeless set in. I'm not going to get the same status that I've, been, that I've been working for. I'm not going to get the same rank. I'm about to, I'm about to fall, fall, fall out of the, 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 you know, I'm about to fall out of position. When, when you know, my, my status is in danger. You created him from mud. You created me from fire. And so he began to feel like, whoa, wait a minute. Whew. Somebody's going to be better than me? Somebody's going to have a higher rank, a higher status than me? I can't do it. I'm not bowing down. I'm not doing it. Now, what's the significance in that? Because this was a command from Allah. This was an amr from Allah. This is the difference. This is the, the relationship between amr wal khalaq. The, the relationship between command and creation. That Allah gives a command... But because we're looking at creation, we're like, I'm looking at the creation, and Allah's like, D do this. I'm commanding you to do this. And I'm like, but this creation, you know, I can't do that because, you know, there's so many of them that, you know, I don't know. I can't let them marry my daughters because, I, I mean, you know, I don't know. You know, they could, I don't know. I, you, know we, you know, they won't be able to watch Egyptian movies with me. <laughs> you know, I, uh, you know, he's, he's not going to understand my grandmother. <laughs> you know, she, he speaks Urdu, and she, he, they're not going to be able to understand each other. Mm -mm. I don't know, he doesn't, I don't know about his family. Uh, I don't know, I don't know about it. We're going to lose our status. We're going to lose our rank. Somebody's going to look at me and say, oh, that's your son-in-law? <laughs> right? When that baby comes out, you're going to be like, oh, it's not Safi. <laughs> right? We're going to lose. And subhanAllah, from, from that, it, it's a deep sickness in our heart. So being this hashtag, being black and Muslim, is a resurgence. Because once a, it's a resurgence of moving from that messianic leadership of like El Haj and Malik Shabazz and some of those other great leaders like Sheikh ah, uh, Ahmed Dao Faisal, e even, e even those great leaders that we had, like even... Um, Imam Jamil al -Amin and some people who had very strong positions in their community and recognizing what has happened to them and then being able to, being able to pick up the pieces, right? Which, is, which has been a through line in being black and being Muslim is this spirit of resistance, this spirit of pushing back and saying, ahad, ahad, that despite the situation, it's Allah Ta'ala I believe in. Right? And being able to say from that spirit of resistance, we recognize, we will acknowledge the first thing being black and being Muslim was like just Eid pictures. Just show Eid pictures of you and your beautiful children, right? And then it was like, okay, I'm tired of eating biryani and kebab, you know, at iftars and Eid. Like, I want some chicken. I want some barbecue chicken. I want, you know, I want some collard greens, some mustard greens. I'd be, give me some peach cobbler. I really want that. And I want some bean pie. I want some bean pie. And so, why? Why? Because I'm Muslim too, right? And, and this idea, that I want us to understand that when we talk about culturalism, why I had to check, it was the, the underlying feeling that black, there was a problem with black culture, which is why then I had to, when I came, became Muslim, you tried to put us in all kind of clothes, right? From charlois kameez, like all kind of stuff. I got to, because now this is the Muslim clothes and I can't eat my food anymore because that's not halal food. That's not like Islamic food. So now I have to eat this food. And this is erasure. And so this being black and being Muslim is, a recla is reclaiming who we are. 
And trust me, subhanAllah, we might feel initially it's, it's divisive, like being black and being Muslim, does that push us out? No. This calling on this strength, right? That you, he who knows himself knows his Lord. Calling on that strength, pulling on those, and actually their, the claim that black Muslims have to America is your history as well. It's, it's your claim to America as well. And so once they're pulling on that strength and picking themselves up, trust me, it will elevate us and benefit us all. So I just say, learn about it, embrace it, be comfortable with it, and let's continue to celebrate each other and let's really create unity and diversity, not based on color blindness, but based on truth. Jazakumullah khairan assalamu alaikum. Okay, Jazakallah khair, sister. Um, so our time, we actually went over time, so um, we don't have time for question and answer. So if you guys have any um, questions, you guys can come and talk to the speakers afterwards. Um, Maghrib starts at th uh, 7.30, so just in a few minutes, if you guys want to start heading downstairs for that. Jazakallah khair for attending.